I had to walk away from my fiance after her toxic family pulled her back in now, I'm focusing on my own future. After being engaged for seven months, I struggle with my fiance's abusive family. Am I wrong for wanting to leave? I've been dating my fiance for four years and have been engaged for seven months. We are trying to plan out a wedding for roughly fall next year. Her childhood was terrible and abusive to put it mildly. Her parents were raging narcissists and she was the scapegoat for her two brothers. She was abused and thrown out the moment she turned 18. She was, however, a great student and hard worker. So with some scholarships and a part-time job, she has a great career and is pretty independent. The problem is that she still had contact with her family. None of them have changed. Well, actually, something has changed. They have become more financially dependent on her. They enjoy slowly creeping back into her life and emotionally blackmailing her for support or whatever she can do. They're not pleasant about it either. They're rude, smug, and generally enjoy being a nuisance. And my fiance can't say no, no matter the horrible things they say or how they outright try to intimidate her openly. I've always known her family history and have always supported her through the issues with them, but in the last year or so they've become far more brazen and asinine. They come over to our house more often. They make messes all around the place. Her mother acts like she's the fucking stepmother from Cinderella. Her dad drinks all my fucking beer and empties out half the fridge. Her brothers stop by occasionally to act as mouthpieces for their parents. They practically trash the place and leave us to clean the mess. And where is my fiancé in all this? Quietly standing in the corner practically shaking. I'm no fool here. There's legitimate trauma. There's her need to feel loved by them, and her hoping they will appreciate her. Before one of you noble commenters states the obvious, she's been in therapy for this for years. I've tried to establish boundaries. For nearly two years I've been trying to push these ass clowns away, but this is her house she purchased. And no matter of contributions financial of otherwise will she let me have a say on who comes into her house. She's been beaten down mentally and emotionally by them for so long. She has told me recently that she wants to earn their approval. How they were right about her how she needs to be better for them. I've had too many emotional conversations with tears and begging to count, hoping she will take the steps to get better. But she's an adult. I can't force her to do anything. I love her, but I can't help but feel so resentful of what she's doing. It's agonizing watching someone you love, someone who you know deserves so much better, openly destroy themselves for people like her family. It's been painful watching her cry herself to sleep one too many nights because of them. I've tried too many times to help her get out of their clutches but I have to think of the future. What happens when we have kids? What happens when she is postpartum and invites them over? What happens if there is a medical emergency for either of us? What if our finances get tight and they still demand money? This is the in-law family from hell and I won't be able to avoid them. Tomorrow I'm going to tell her how I want to delay the wedding until firm boundaries are established. If she resents me, I walk. I can't do it anymore. I refuse to watch a slow death like this any further. Update talked to her, and it went about as well as one could possibly expect. Currently getting myself set up in a hotel for a few days and working on possible long-term plans for moving out. Still a lot going on right now, but maybe sometime next week I'll be able to put everything together into one update. Relevant comments. Comment 1. Would the two of you be open to couples therapy? Therapy is too often brought up as the ultimate solution to relationship problems, but in this instance, having a neutral third party who is experienced and qualified in the area of couples therapy could be really helpful. Best of luck, and the only Oz here are her family op. I've hinted at it before, but she hasn't been very receptive. I'm hoping tomorrow I can try and pursue that and not have to make an ultimatum. Comment 2. You can't save her if she doesn't want to be saved. Even if she wants to, you'd only be able to help and support. She needs to be the one to enforce the boundaries and hold them. But she doesn't? It's up to you if you want this for life. Have you spoken to her about where you are? That you're on the verge of breaking up with her for this lack of boundaries? No, it's not to manipulate her into choosing you. Although some will say that, it's just a statement of fact. She may be willing to sacrifice everything for her family, but you are not. If this is the life you have to look forward to, you don't want it. You need to put yourself and your needs first. Who knows? It may prompt her to open her eyes and put herself first with her family, but likely not. Update 1. The night after I made the first post I had decided that I was going to have a heart-to-heart -heart with my fiancé about her family. However, she came back from work the next day early, and I already was off that day so I initiated the talk a little sooner than I planned. Essentially, I told her how this arrangement was not sustainable. I did not feel comfortable marrying her due to how much involvement in her life her family has, and I certainly did not feel comfortable bringing a child into this world with them. I didn't want to tell her cold turkey no contact with them, but strict limitations to start with on then coming over, and what they can do around the house. I also requested couples therapy before marriage, she wasn't happy. 
She was just staring angrily at me while I spoke then started yelling at me when I finished. She told me I don't understand their dynamic and it worked for her. I told her that they're abusive users who will bleed her dry and I have never seen them show any decency to her. She told me she just had to work harder for them to appreciate her. I basically yelled at her that a parent's child shouldn't have to beg and plead and work for them to be loved. I finally told her that she sets limits with them or I walk. She was livid and since I was living in her house I was kicked out. So the past few days I have been staying in a hotel and have had my stuff taken out and put into storage. And frankly, it's been great. I am going to stay with family for a few weeks around mid-July and after that I am going to go house searching for myself. I have spent the last couple days relaxing, catching up on movies and video games I haven't had time for and could go back from work to a quiet room without her family tearing the place apart. Yesterday, however, things came to a head. We have basically been no contact since she booted me out, but I know every Saturday her family loves to spend the afternoon over and she uses me as a shield from their abuse. However, in a very petty move, I simply kept my phone muted all day and played Disco Elysian. I knew she would call back for help with her family and at this point pure resentment was kicking in for her and I wanted nothing you do with her issues. By the end of the night she had sent me over a dozen texts and finally two frantic voicemails begging me to come home. I decided to come over to check up on her. Long story short she was sobbing in the living room and when I came to talk to her she was practically crushing my back hugging me and sobbing. I gave her time to cool off and asked what happened. Long story short her parents and brother came by to gift money from her and say horrible shit to her. She wanted to have me come over to help but I was ignoring her. And when she tried to have one of her friends help out and everyone basically said fuck that. It all started clicking in for her. She kicked her family out but not before they said some utterly vile shit to her I won't repeat. She kept apologizing to me and told me over and over to come home. I told her plainly that I had started to build up heavy resentment towards her for some time and while I loved her and understand it was trauma and not her being outright abusive, there was major issues that would need to be addressed if we were to move forward. She sells the house and moves. We make roughly the same amount of money and we will buy a house together. I am a grown ass man and I will not live in a house I have no equal agency over. Her family will never step a foot in it, they will never come over. They will be treated by me in a very threatening manner if they try and come in. She gets a new therapist and we start premarital counseling. She never makes me interact with her family. We will go LC with her family right now but make no mistake we are working towards full NC on her end. I told her I love her, we have been together for a while now and have beautiful memories together and I know she is suffering from abuse. But these are non-negotiable, and if she has a problem with any of them then we have to go out separate ways. She told me she's realized for a while now that her family is toxic and unhealthy she wants to make changes. She has accepted but some of these will take a while to see through. For now I am going to stay in the hotel, until I head back to stay with my family. She is welcome to come over, but I have made it clear her house is not somewhere I want to go. Her and I are both off tomorrow so we will spend the day here and maybe go out. This is obviously not over yet, but I might not post anything else until mid-August or so. Relevant comments. Comment 1. It's cute you think she won't continue to choose her family over you, but it's going to be even worse once you're legally bound by a home purchase. Comment 2. She isn't going to follow through. She is going to do anything she can to keep you around as her shield, but she isn't going to cut them off. And if you get a house together and God forbid have a child, you're then tied to them and your child is tied to them for the rest of your life. The best thing you can do is step away. Update 2. Despite all intentions of not updating until much later with the hopes of an improved relationship with my fiance and her establishing boundaries with her toxic family, we are now broken up. Essentially what happened was after last weekend where I left her for the time to deal with them herself. She seemed to finally grasp the situation and was open to changes including boundaries and a possible move. We spent Monday and Tuesday hanging out in my hotel that I was staying in until I went back to my family for a couple weeks. The other night she was being very vague with texting when she originally was supposed to come over. She came much later than expected, and I knew something was up. She basically unloaded on me how I was abusive, controlling, overly demanding and unsupportive. It took me five fucking seconds to figure out she was repeating verbatim some sort of rehearsed speech from her parents. And to be honest, I was so agitated at this point. Despite making a huge gamble on her I decided to be a prick about it. I asked her if her family told her to say this. She said they suggested it to her but she came up with it herself, Suduuri. I asked her to explain in detail what I did. She said I was living like a parasite off her. I reminded her that I'm paying 50 50 for her fucking mortgage, 50 50 for utilities and groceries as well. I have my own car I pay for. A job that makes just about as much as hers, unlike her fucking leech parents who demand payments on the weekly, 
and raid the kitchen on the weekends. I told her to try again with something better. She looked flustered and said I was trying to isolate her. I kind of smirked like a jackass and told her that I have always supported her many friendships that she has destroyed on her own because no one wants to deal with her family or be used as a shield like me. I was practically demanding to know at this point why she is so hell-bent on destroying her life for these people. She just kind of shouted that I don't understand her family and she's just trying to earn their love back and was basically ranting at that point. It's just so staggering to see up close. I have ventured into a few subreddits to get perspectives. And, if you have any familiarity with them, you'll see how people who are victims of abuse by their own family can be so utterly broken by it that it'll wreck their brain to where they truly believe they are the problem and they deserve the abuse. Well, that's how she was. She was utterly broken and didn't want help. She didn't want to get better. She just wanted to get worse. It hit me like a truck, honestly. The realization. I really did feel like a fool for trying even if it was what I was supposed to do in the first place. She was practically berserk at this point, and I was just mentally exhausted and needed her to leave before someone called the police. She finally left, but I had a few concerned neighbors check on me. Some of her friends are aware as they have messaged me checking on the situation. I told them the truth, and that I just needed to be alone to think what to do next right now. They have revealed that she has given them similar rants after they expressed concern for her. One had even heard that she may be possibly at risk of losing her job. She is definitely having some sort of mental break. From my understanding, she is now completely isolated. She is actually sprinting into a horrible, lonely life right now. There's nothing I can do for her at this point. And as selfish as it sounds, I'm just glad it's going to be behind me. Relevant comments. Comment 1. Move out. Cut all contact. Move on. You can't make someone help themselves. Comment 2. Sorry it went this way, but you can't help someone who doesn't want it. In many ways, she sounds like an addict, and her addiction is to the vile treatment she gets from her family, and to the faint hope that they'll love her someday. She has to hit rock bottom, just like any addict, but you shouldn't be around when that happens. Update 3, things have kinda wrapped up but there were some loose ends. I completely forgot to change my mailing address which I should have done ASAP so a couple important things got sent to her house. I had to go pick them up plus a final couple of items I want for my move that I left there and decided I wanted to actually take. She was being difficult and not responding to messages in regards to them, so I had to go get them from her myself. I brought a mutual friend, just in case. Thankfully she was at least cooperative in letting me get my stuff, and it wasn't much of an issue. Everything else was though, she had a lot of nasty things to say telling me she was already sleeping around, telling me how happy she was now that I was gone, telling me she's finally free of me, how she's going to be so much better off without me. A lot of generic insults and horrible things you would commonly expect from a nasty breakup. And you know what? It was so fucking obvious it was a rehearsed script from her family and you could easily see how miserable she was. She looked like a mess, like she hasn't slept in days. The house was a mess. She wasn't even yelling it. She sounded so exhausted and broken when she said it. She didn't even smile when she said anything. Just a face contorted in hate and anger. She was not the woman I knew anymore. That person was gone. When I was getting ready to leave, she was still going on. I was fed up and told her something along the lines of, Congratulations. Your friends are gone. Your human shields are gone. Your engagement is over. Your support is gone. Anyone who ever treated you like a decent human being is gone. It's just you and your family. I hope you're happy while they bleed you dry. It probably didn't go like that, but something like it. She just stood there. Literally just stood there and looked at me with indifference and walked away as I walked out the door. As we were leaving, the mutual friend Tiffany asked if I was okay. I reassured her I was and I'm just trying to get myself set up to go home next week. She also confirmed that she hears my ex did lose her job for not showing up for several days and basically ghosting them. They're going to try an intervention next week and asked if I could participate but I'm not delaying my travel because frankly I just want a clean break. I know for a fact that if I stay involved in only going to be witnessing the slow descent to either a full break or a suicide. I just can't do that. Despite all this I'm actually excited for the future and I have realized that I ignored way too many red flags at the beginning. Even with everything that happened I know I'll be doing good and I'm going to be all right. I expect this to be my final update. I'm still in town until Sunday afternoon so something could happen while I'm still here but if anything does it won't be exciting. Comments Comment 1. Not participating in the intervention was the right choice. Maybe it'll help her but not your problem. She's proud of sleeping around. Comment 2. She's becoming her family. You did the right thing. I come from a family much like hers. I've watched multiple cousins evolve into the next generation of abusive AIAs after once swearing they'd get away. They cared more about their family's approval than they did their mental well-being, and now they're miserable 
and just like their parents to their own kids. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you. My new friends think I'm anorexic and are planning an intervention, but I actually have celiac disease. After years of struggle with my health and family, I just want to be understood and accepted. Am I the asshole for being upset that my new friend group thinks I'm anorexic and is planning an intervention, even though I have celiac disease? Original post. A little background. My parents divorced when I was very young. My mom got me for most of the year and my dad got me for the summer. I hated going to my dad's house. Partially because he was very stubborn and rude and always had to do things his way, but also because every time I went to my dad's house I got violently sick. Nausea, rashes, pain, muscle cramps, and then when I got older I'd start missing my periods. TMI. I went to a doctor, but he said it was a psychosomatic problem related to stress and directed me to see a therapist. My dad didn't let me see a therapist because he thought it was total crap. My mom took me to one a few times, but by then my symptoms had cleared up so we couldn't tell if it helped at all. One thing that really pissed me off was that my dad ate a lot of junk food and drank soda instead of water, and he mocked me mercilessly if I tried to eat healthy. I think it reminded him of my mom, because she's always been a bit of a health nut. I would sneak carrots into the house, and if he found them he'd throw them out. At my mom's house, I'd eat vegetables and organic chicken. Sometimes food would make me feel sick, but I'd just stop eating that food and it was fine. I got into the habit of turning down any food offered to me because I didn't know if it was safe. I just explained it away as being a picky eater. And then, when I was 16, a new girl moved to my school. I became friends with her, and after a couple months I noticed that she avoided all the same foods as me. I mentioned it in passing like, Hey, isn't that weird? And she got concerned and told me that she had celiac disease and I should get myself checked. I got checked and sure enough, I had it. Everything suddenly made sense. I was so excited to finally understand what was wrong that I told everybody I knew. I told all of the people who I thought were my friends. And they didn't really react well. They acted fine at first, but I noticed that they were all doing the slow fade on me. I confronted my closest friend about it and she said that they all thought I was faking it for attention. They'd only heard about gluten-free diets as a stupid fad. I broke down crying and told her all about how horrible I felt when I had to go to my dad's house, and how I couldn't believe that she didn't believe me, and she was horrified. She turned around and became my biggest supporter. She talked to the others, but they still thought I was full of shit and feeding her lies, so we decided it was best to break it off with them. My birthday is in August, so I had two more summers with my dad left to go through after I found out. He took the revelation about my disease even worse than my ex-friends. He would scream that I thought I was better than him and I was making up medical problems because I wanted to be special and that he wouldn't put up with that shit. I offered to take him with me to the doctor, but he said that doctors are scam artists and he didn't believe anything they said. It was horrible. It got to the point where he started sabotaging my food and cursing at me when I got sick, so I've gotten pretty wary about telling people about the disease. Between my personal experiences, and hearing people make fun of gluten-free food on TV and the internet. I've decided I'm not comfortable with telling new people. I know that's cowardly, but I'm so afraid of what people will think of me. This is my last summer with my dad, and it's the last summer with my dad. He can rot in hell for all I care. He treats me like shit. I've only got to tough it out for another few weeks. That's not my problem. I can already hear your advice about leaving my dad's house or calling seeps and respectfully. I've made my decision that it's easier just to stay for the next three weeks and then leave forever. Please don't focus on that part. This is the problem I need help with. My best friend and I have made a new group of friends. They're great people, really fun. We play role-playing games every weekend. We've been hanging out since May. There's 10 or 11 of them depending on whether you count this guy who doesn't regularly attend games. My best friend approached me yesterday and told me that the rest of the group has been talking behind my back. They've put together the fact that I constantly turn down food and that I'm very picky about what I eat and that I've been getting thinner and acting sick because I've been living with my dad and come to the conclusion that I have anorexia. They're planning on staging an intervention for me next weekend. Guys, I don't know what to do. This is such an awkward situation. I know I should tell them, but I'm so scared they're going to reject me. They've already got this idea in their heads about what's wrong. At this point, I'm afraid they'll think I'm just making excuses. And I've been burned before. I lost a ton of friends by telling them about my disease. Yeah, they were dicks, but it fucking hurt. How do I do this? How do I explain it so they'll believe me? I can't handle any more people calling me a liar, 
I'll have a mental breakdown. This disease has ruined my life in so many ways. I just wanted to have this one part of my life separate from that. Please read it. Give me advice. Told her. I can't eat gluten. That means I have to turn down food a lot. And I'm in a situation where it's forced on me so I'm sick and losing weight. The last friends I told accused me of lying and broke it off with me. So I haven't told my new friends. They got the wrong idea and now think I'm anorexic. They're going to hold an intervention next weekend. And I have no idea what to say. Update. Hey guys, thanks for all your help. The intervention was yesterday and I figured you guys would want to know how everything went. Told her. It went well. A few hours before game started, one of my friends, let's call him Zach, texted me asking to come to his house. He hosts the games. Early because he wanted to discuss gaming terms that will be nonsense to most of you. I figured this was probably the intervention and texted my best friend. I think there was some confusion in the last post. This is the friend who was with my other friend group, who I poured my heart out, to then she followed me to the new group. Let's call her Laura. To ask if she'd been invited to. She hadn't so I asked her to come with me. Before I went to his house, I did something a little cheeky inspired by one of the comments on the last post. Thanks you. I'd have to charge. I went and picked up some gluten-free Chinese food from a place I frequent. They have this amazing vegetable fried rice that I've fallen in love with. They're really careful about cross-contamination. I've been eating there for years and never gotten sick. I brought the food with me to Zach's house, along with Laura and my notebooks and dice for role-playing. Zach seemed really taken aback that Laura was there. I asked him if he had a problem with it, because if we were going to talk about complicated gaming things, then she should be part of the conversation because of qualifications. Uh, I'm really sorry. I'm trying not to drop a crapton of gaming jargon on why all. He awkwardly said that it was fine. Then I said something like, is it alright if I eat something while we do this? I missed lunch and I'm really hungry and pulled out the Chinese food. He said it was fine but seemed kind of alarmed like I was freaking him out. I started eating and he started his pitch, you help help celiac. I didn't actually call you here to talk about game crap. Me and some of the others have noticed some things recently that we're concerned about and they elected me to talk to you about it. I said, okay. He listed off a bunch of things that I've been doing that made them worry about me. The way they never saw me eat anything that I always seemed sick and was getting thinner, the fact that I always seemed uncomfortable and nervous when the topic of food came up, that I turned down everything offered to me, and then he finally dropped the bombshell. You help help celiac. Michael's older sister is anorexic, and she acts a lot like you do. We think you might be anorexic. I swallowed my food and tried not to look nervous. I'm not, I told him. He started talking about how nobody thinks they're anorexic, but there's clearly something going on with me, and he started just rambling so I cut him off. I do have a problem. It's not anorexia, can I talk? He reluctantly agreed. I think he was afraid I was going to say that I was too fat, and my problem was that I needed to lose weight or something. Like, he really got committed to the idea that I was anorexic. I'm going to try to paraphrase what I said here because I was very proud of myself for it. I know I'm losing weight in an unhealthy way, but it's not on purpose. I have a disease that means I can't eat grains like wheat, barley, and rye. When I do, I get very sick and my body starts ripping up my stomach and I can't digest much of anything, even things that don't have those grains in them. It's not just an allergy. It does serious long-term damage to me. If I ate a piece of bread, I would break out in rashes, I'd start throwing up and I might get stuff that seems unrelated like horrible muscle cramps. When I turn down food, it's because you guys offer me stuff like Doritos and PBJs. If I ate that stuff, it would make me violently ill. I turn it down to keep from making my health problems even worse. And the reason my symptoms have been popping up and I've been getting sick and losing weight is that right now I'm living in a family situation where I'm forced to eat the foods that my body reacts badly to. When I first met you guys I was living with my mom and she accommodated me really well. But right now I'm living with my dad and he sabotages my food because he thinks I'm making my disease up and that my doctor is a fraud. Zach took out actual note cards and looked through them. He literally had a script for the intervention. That's what I get for hanging out with the kind of dramatic people who play tabletop RPGs, I guess. He was quiet for a really long time. Then he had a few questions. But then why do you turn down my Coke? Because Coke is nasty, but I didn't want to complain and make you guys buy root beer just for me. Two. Why didn't you just tell us this stuff? Laura took this one and explained what happened with our last friend group. 3. Okay, so what would I probably have in the house right now that you'd be willing to eat in front of me? I wanted to facepalm at this one. I asked if he was serious. He was. I don't know, have you got celery? He shook his head. Yogurt? Nope. An apple? Nope. Seriously. He nodded. Have you got some freaking popcorn? Like air-popped popcorn? That he did have. 
so I ate some popcorn in front of him, and he finally seemed to accept what I was saying. He awkwardly changed the subject to gaming things and we talked about that until the rest of the group started to show up. When Michael got there, Zach took him aside and started talking to him in a way that I guess they thought was subtle. They kept looking over at me, and they weren't keeping their voices down very well. Michael asked if I seemed offensive and Zach shrugged and said not really. I pointedly ate popcorn for the rest of the game. Michael texted me after the game and apologized for assuming that I was anorexic and asked what snacks they could put out for me. I actually cried a little bit. I was worried about getting kicked out but they immediately moved to accommodate me. They're nice people. Now to the next story, story stew. My cousin married my toxic ex, spread lies about me, trashed me at their wedding, and then tried breaking into my house. So my cousin Julia, 27F, started dating my ex-boyfriend Louie, 29M, two years ago. I, 27F, had been with Louis for three years. We started dating after he graduated, and I was in my second year of college. We stayed together for three years and broke up a couple of weeks after my 20th birthday. It was honestly not a good relationship and I regret that it was my first relationship as an adult. He and I were perfect on paper, but in reality, things were quite different. He was really insecure and controlling, not letting me do anything by myself like going out with friends to bars or even talking to my male friends. He was always keeping tabs on me, and any time I didn't do what he wanted, he would manipulate and gaslight me into thinking I was the problem. I was pretty desperate to keep him around, so I would bend over for him, but that was still not enough. He was the one who dumped me, saying things weren't working out, and then proceeded to block me so I couldn't contact him. I tried really hard to get in touch with him, but after the breakup he was completely gone. Within two months, I heard from people that he had already moved on to another girlfriend. That relationship felt like a colossal waste of my time and I really don't like that guy. We had no contact for a while after the breakup, but when I turned 25, he unblocked me and reached out to wish me a happy birthday. I didn't respond, and I thought it was strange that he was texting me, especially since I had moved on and was with someone else. He kept texting me even though I didn't reply, so I eventually blocked him again, and we didn't speak for months. A few months after my birthday, Julia invited me over and told me she wanted to introduce me to someone. To my shock, it was Louis. Apparently, the reason he had been texting me earlier was that he wanted to make things right with me before he started dating Julia. They had met through work and were quite serious about each other. Julia and I had been really close since childhood, so it came as a big shock to me. She knew how toxic he had been to me, so I was taken aback when I realized they were together. Julia told me she knew I would be uncomfortable, but she wanted me to give him another chance. I wanted to be happy for Julia, but Louis was someone who had caused me a lot of pain, especially since he was my first serious relationship. I had a major grudge against him for how he treated me. Despite trying to be respectful, I told Julia that I couldn't accept her relationship with Louis and didn't think I wanted to be a part of her life anymore. She was really upset and tried talking to me several times after that, but I just couldn't accept it. Of all people, she knew exactly how toxic he had been to me, and how traumatized I was because of him, yet she still went ahead with dating him. She kept insisting that he had changed and was a better person now, but I didn't buy it. She was free to have him in her life and be with him. I didn't have a problem with that, but I also had the right to cut him, and by association, her out of my life. It was very simple for me, though obviously really hard as well, since Julia and I were really good friends in addition to being cousins. But it was something I absolutely had to do for my own sake, and I did it. After she told me that she had started dating Louis, I stopped speaking to her. For the past two years, we have been cold to each other. Once she realized that I wasn't going to talk to her, she started acting distant with me too, and I don't blame her for that. We would meet at events and simply ignore each other. Whereas we used to be the cousins who stuck together and gossiped about everyone else, things were different now. I was honestly okay with that. Everybody has their own life and the freedom to do as they please, so I didn't have a problem with her. I just didn't want to speak to her anymore. That was it from my side, but I guess she took it personally and wanted to get back at me or something. So she took it upon herself to start talking crap about me to other family members and ruin my image, which I didn't think was necessary at all because I would never do that to her. I had never done that to her, even though we weren't getting along. For the past year, she had been telling everyone that I was the reason for my breakup with Lewis and claiming I had no morals or ethics. She and Lewis had been spreading rumors, saying that I would flirt with other guys right in front of him and that was the real reason he became possessive and controlling. They made it sound like I was the flirt, and that's why he got insecure, but it couldn't have been further from the truth. It was actually the other way around. He was the one who would be overly friendly with other women and expected me to be fine with it, 
but didn't like it when I had male friends, even though I kept those relationships completely platonic. He constantly manipulated and gaslighted me into cutting people out of my life. I found their attempts to ruin my reputation among my own family members very offensive, but I was too busy with my life to care about the rumors they were spreading. It wasn't like anyone actually believed them, so I was fine with it. I didn't respond or react, as I knew that would give them exactly what they wanted, a reaction. I was also aware that putting an end to this would be easy for me. All I had to do was talk to my aunt, and she would take care of it. Even though I was no longer close with Julia, I was still close with her mother, who happened to be a federal court judge. I knew she would do the right thing. She's my dad's older sister, and everyone knows she has a spine of steel. She would never do anything underhanded or wrong, so I'm not sure how Julia turned out the way she did despite being her daughter. One conversation with my aunt would put an end to all of this, but I knew that Julia would suffer as a consequence since she was financially dependent on her mother. She had recently started her own jewelry line, but from what I heard it wasn't doing too well. I didn't want to bother my aunt with such petty things, and I knew I was strong enough to handle it on my own. I wanted to let this go on and see what kind of ridiculous rumors they would come up with, because either way, my other cousins were still coming up to me and telling me what Julia had been saying behind my back. It was amusing to me, almost a form of entertainment. Then, six months ago, they got engaged and announced their wedding date. Soon after, my parents received an invitation but I didn't and I was fine with it. I didn't expect to be invited to the wedding anyway. I don't think I would have wanted to attend even if I'd been invited, given everything that had happened between Julia and me, let alone between me and Louis. The wedding took place three days ago and it was just another day for me, so I wasn't concerned about what was going on there. But after a certain point, my phone started flooding with texts from family members, all harping on about some speech that Louis and Julia had made at the wedding. I was confused until my parents called and told me they needed to talk. They were the ones who finally explained what had happened, and I lost my temper. Apparently, they had taken the opportunity at the wedding to make a horrible speech about me, spreading as many nasty rumors as they could. They wanted to turn the entire family against me. I guess they might have succeeded if I hadn't had any evidence against them in my arsenal. Julia and Louis were clever enough not to mention me by name, but they kept referring to a certain ex-girlfriend, who wasn't at the wedding, which obviously meant me. Who else could it have been? They repeated all the rumors they had tried to spread about me before, saying I was a flirt and apparently a gold digger too. They claimed I would rely on Louis for money and expect him to pay for everything, all because I was just a college student and couldn't be wasteful. So I supposedly demanded that he take care of me financially. None of this was true. I always made a point to split everything on our dates and never expected him to pay for anything, let alone demand it. But the most horrible accusation they made by far was claiming that I had cheated on him, which was supposedly what ended the relationship. Then at the wedding, they said they were glad I was out of their lives and not at the wedding, as they didn't want such a negative influence around. They even gave the family an ultimatum, saying from now on they could either invite me to family events or invite them, but if I were present, they wouldn't attend. After that, the texts kept flooding my phone. But I only learned the full story from my parents, and I was majorly pissed. I thanked my parents for what they had done, as they had left the wedding immediately after the speech because they couldn't stand Julia going to such lengths. They also told me that my aunt, Julia's mother, was perplexed by what was going on and had spoken to them, asking if what Julia had claimed in her speech was true. It seemed very out of character for me, and she was right. I hadn't done anything Julia accused me of and my aunt was correct to doubt her daughter's truthfulness. After learning what they had said about me in their wedding speech, I decided to go all out. I dug up old screenshots from the past to prove they were lying. It took a lot of digging, and I had to scroll for several minutes to find the part one was looking for. Thankfully, after a long time, I was able to find the screenshots of the chat between me and Lewis from around the time we were breaking up. Thankfully, after a really long time, I was able to find the screenshots of the chat between me and my ex that I'd been looking for. These were from around the time when we were breaking up and he had been particularly toxic and vicious. At that point, he had said a lot of nasty things to me, like how he wished he had never started dating me, and how he had wasted three years of his life with me when he had the option to be with other people, as many women had expressed interest in him. He even said that now he could finally go out with other people. There was no mention of cheating, and I'm pretty sure if I had cheated on him, he wouldn't have let it go so easily. I scrolled even further back and found more chats where he was being toxic towards me. Then, I went ahead and posted it all online without any explanation or caption, because I knew those chats would speak for themselves, and they did. After I posted the screenshots, people started texting me and commenting on the post, saying they knew the rumors weren't true because it seemed so out of character for me. Everyone had known me since I was a child, 
and I wasn't the kind of person to do such things. Those screenshots proved that they were lying, and knowing that my family was on my side was all I needed. In fact, several people contacted me to say they had left the wedding because of the things Julia and Lewis had said about me. While Julia and Lewis had hoped to turn people against me, their speech backfired horribly, and no one was on their side anymore. Worst of all, not even my aunt was on their side anymore, which was a huge blow for them. They contacted me the night of the wedding, literally begging for forgiveness. Apparently, after seeing the screenshots I had posted, my aunt had spoken to them and expressed how disappointed she was. Julia had been so dishonest and had tried to ruin my reputation simply because she couldn't stand that I had cut her off for dating my ex-boyfriend. Most of the wedding guests had already left because of the drama, and my aunt told Julia she was deeply upset and disappointed in her behavior. She expected better from her daughter. My aunt even said that until Julia apologized to me and I forgave her she would cut the two of them out of her life as well. Then she left, despite Julia's desperate attempts to convince her not to. Julia had been financially dependent on her mother for quite some time, and she had even been planning to shut down her business to take a break, which meant she would need her mother's support even more. But since my aunt had decided to cut her off, things were not going according to plan, and Julia was really worried about her future. That's why she and Louis contacted me, wanting me to forgive them, take down the post, and speak to my aunt about the situation. I was still really upset about everything that had happened, so I refused to do any of that and blocked both of them. Since then, they have been trying desperately to contact me and get me to change my mind, and now I'm really confused about what I should do. My aunt is an upright woman, and we have spoken. She contacted me the day after the wedding to apologize for what Julia had done, but I told her I didn't want my relationship with Julia to affect our relationship. I hadn't let it happen in the past, and I still wouldn't let it happen now. So it's all cool between us and I know for a fact that if I speak to my aunt I can make things right for Julia. But I personally feel like I don't really need to. She is a full-grown adult woman, and she should be able to sort things out for herself and face the consequences of her actions. However, I also feel like a jerk knowing that I can help her and am choosing not to. I'm just kind of conflicted about what to do right now. So please help me out, AITA, for not speaking to my aunt and convincing her to forgive my cousin after she made a horrible speech at her wedding with my ex-boyfriend about me. Update 1 Hello. First of all, thank you so much for all the comments and support. Before I get into the update, I just want to clear something up. My parents attended the wedding, like a lot of other family members, because they are part of the older generation in our family. They weren't exactly aware of the rumors being spread about me. Louis and Julia were mostly talking to our cousins and relatives in the same generation as us, around the same age. They kept the older folks out of it, so my parents had absolutely no idea what was being said about me. They attended the wedding out of respect for my aunt, even though they were vaguely aware that there was some bad blood between Julia and me after she started dating Louis. I had not said anything to my parents or complained to them on purpose, just as I hadn't mentioned anything to my aunt because I didn't want to drag them or involve them in such petty things. I thought I was above all of that, but clearly Julia and Louis were not. Anyway, the point is, my parents didn't know, and that's why they attended the wedding. So, there's no need for anyone to question them or blame them. As soon as they and some of the older family members found out what was being said about me at the wedding, they chose to leave and are no longer on speaking terms with Julia or Louis. So it's all fine now, and I hope that's clear. Now moving on. It's been one week since the wedding, and I blocked both Louis and Julia so they couldn't contact me. But that hasn't stopped them from trying. They keep making new accounts on social media and sending me emails, even though I keep blocking them. They are desperate but I've made up my mind that I'm not getting involved or helping them out. I've kept in touch with my aunt, and she has made it clear that she will only resume supporting her daughter after I forgive Julia. But honestly, I don't think I need to forgive her. For one whole year I kept my mouth shut and allowed them to say whatever they wanted about me because I wasn't taking them seriously. But they took that as a free pass to escalate things, and now they're going to have to face the consequences. There's also another point. I honestly don't feel like Julia deserves her mother's support. She's in her late twenties and by now she should have a sense of what she wants to do in life. I can't imagine anyone still relying on their parents for money at this point. It's not as if she's not educated or competent. She's just always been too lazy to stick to a job. It was that way in our early 20s when we had just graduated, and I thought she would grow out of it, but it's still the same now. In a way, I think I'm doing her a favor. Not receiving financial support from my aunt might push her to be better at her job or whatever she decides to do. Either way, I've made up my mind that I'm not going to help her out. I've discussed this decision with my parents just to ease the burden of the situation. Either way, 
I have made up my mind that I'm not going to help her out. I discussed this decision with my parents to let go of some of the guilt I had been feeling, and they said I was perfectly justified in whatever I decided to do. It was my call whether or not I wanted to forgive her, and I didn't have to if I didn't feel she deserved it, just because I was worried about what might happen to her in the future. Besides, Lewis still had a decent job and could support the two of them if they really needed to get by without any financial help from my aunt. The bottom line is, I spoke to my parents, some of my friends, and even you guys here, and most people agree that I have no reason to feel guilty. So I feel much better now, to be honest. I've also taken the post down because I don't think it needed to stay up much longer. Everyone in the family already knows what went down, and I didn't want to keep it on my profile, as it would be difficult to explain everything to people who follow me. It was much easier to just take it down. Right now I'm focusing on myself and trying to let go of all the anger and guilt I'd been feeling over the past few days. I've returned to meditating and am trying to deal with everything in a more zen way. I really hope that Julia and Louis also try to do better with their lives instead of making me the reason they wake up every morning, as they've been doing so far. I think that would be better for all of us. Update 2 Hi So it's been a month since the wedding, and from what I know, Louis and Julia are back to their usual behavior. My aunt is still not speaking to them because I haven't forgiven them yet, and at this point, I don't feel the need to. I know their apology wasn't genuine, they were only apologizing because they wanted money from my aunt. They didn't actually mean it. After a few days of trying to convince me to forgive them and ask my aunt to speak to them, they gave up when I didn't respond. After that, they went back to spreading rumors about me, and this time they got really creative. Apparently they've been telling everyone that I was trying to ruin their relationship with my aunt on purpose because I wanted all the inheritance for myself. It's so absurd. I would never do something like that. My parents are well off and I have a decent job. I'm doing well for myself and I don't even need to think about inheritance. With the grace of God, I won't need to rely on anyone for money. Maybe they're projecting their own insecurities because they need financial support. Either way, they've been spreading these rumors every time they run into someone from the family in public, which happens pretty often since we all live in the same city. People have been avoiding them like the plague, yet they still find a way to bring me up. I'm genuinely baffled by their obsession with me. I've done nothing for the past month except ignore them, and they can't seem to let go of whatever has happened. Last week I got pretty annoyed and told my aunt about it. She told me that even if they apologized now she wouldn't get back in touch with Julia. She communicated this to Julia and blocked her again, which only made them more pissed at me. I know because they made another fake email account to send me an angry message, since that's the only way they can contact me now. They told me they were going to make me pay for all of this. Shiver me timbers. I know they're unhinged right now and while I'm not scared, it's definitely inconvenient. So I wrote back and told them that if they tried anything funny, I would call the cops and not hesitate to send them to jail. I hope that scares them off, and if not, I have a pretty good security system in place. Update 3 Four days ago I received an email from Louis and Julia saying I would have to face the consequences of what I had done. I warned them that if they tried anything, I would report them to the police, but that didn't stop them from doing the most idiotic thing imaginable. Last night they tried to break into my house. Julia has been to my house several times, so she knows I have a very advanced security system. Obviously I was alerted as soon as they attempted to open my door. I don't even know why they thought my door would be unlocked in the middle of the night at 1 a.m. as soon as the alert went off. I called the police and told them someone was trying to break into my house. I suspected it might be Julia and Louis, but I didn't want to take any chances. The police arrived within 15 minutes, and unfortunately for them, Julia and Louis were dressed like burglars and were caught trying to make a run for it a short distance away from my house. Since they hadn't brought their car, they had cycled all the way to my place. They tried to claim that they knew me personally and weren't trying to steal anything, just wanted to break in to intimidate me a little bit. I don't know why they admitted to that, as if it would make them look better in the eyes of the law. Julia immediately started crying once she was placed in handcuffs, begging me not to press charges. But I had no sympathy left for her. You can't keep screwing up and expect people to forgive you. Luis just stared at me with pure hatred, but that didn't bother me in the slightest I'm used to it by now. After that, I went back to sleep, because I had work in the morning. This morning I told my aunt and parents about what happened, and they already knew because Julia had used her phone to reach out to my aunt for bail, but my aunt refused to even see her. So now, nobody knows what's going to happen. I'm definitely going to press charges and seek a protective order against them. They're clearly unhinged, and I don't want anything more to do with them. After a 50-hour coma, I awoke with a new perspective on life, leaving behind despair and embracing hope. Join Maine on my journey of resilience and transformation in a world that once felt dark.
My 50-hour coma experience awakened me, adding faith and love to my life, never have the same thoughts as I did. Have you ever fallen into despair? I certainly have. After a reckless decision, I found myself in a coma for 50 hours. Awakening from that deep slumber, my previous intentions had vanished, replaced by a newfound perspective on life. My hope is that sharing these insights can brighten your view of the world. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I'm Lisa, the eldest child in a financially struggling family, where I grew up with two younger sisters and a brother. In our home, boys were valued over girls, which meant facing numerous challenges from a young age. I was forced to leave school prematurely to work and help my mother manage the significant debts incurred by my father. Just when life seemed to be gaining meaning with the arrival of my boyfriend, Jason, my professional life crumbled as my employer went bankrupt, and I found myself jobless. During this turbulent period, I discovered Jason was seeing someone else. Overwhelmed by despair, I overdosed, leading to a 50-hour coma. Those hours were a journey through my life's highest highs and lowest lows, ultimately teaching me the true value of existence. One poignant memory from when I was 15 was my intense desire for a digital watch, just like the ones my friends wore. To afford it, I skipped meals and took on extra chores, saving every penny. When I finally bought the watch, it brought me immense joy. I cherished it, constantly admiring it on my wrist. However, one day after showering, I returned to find the watch missing from the drawer where I'd left it. Panic set in, and a troubling thought led me outside, where I found my younger brother Lion holding it. Give the watch back to me, I demanded. No, it's mine, he retorted. You took it from my drawer, didn't you? Give it back. No, don't pull it like that, he protested as I reached for it. Give it to me, I insisted, snatching the watch back. Lion fell unexpectedly. What's happening here? My father interjected as Lion cried. Lisa took the watch, and she won't let me play with it, Lion complained. But this watch is mine. I bought it with my savings, I explained. How could you afford it? Give it to him now. I don't make me repeat myself, my father commanded. No, I stood my ground. You dared to defy me, he shouted. My father struck me repeatedly, deaf to my pleas. Ultimately, I had to relinquish the watch to Lion, who smugly trotted off, mocking me with a stick-out tongue. All I could do was weep in silence, nursing a deep-seated resentment. I remember myself at 18, longing to attend university, but all my hopes were dashed. Our family is burdened with a huge debt. If you go to university, I won't be able to support everything for you, my mother said, her voice filled with sorrow and regret. I'll do any job to earn money and take care of myself. You don't need to worry about me. Just let me continue my studies, I pleaded, desperation evident in my tone. Then my father angrily said, A girl doesn't need to study so much. You should quit school, work, and help your mother support the family. But I want. I stammered, my heart sinking. No more buts. Do you dare argue with me? My dad's voice boomed, silencing any further protest. I knelt and begged. Father, please let me continue my studies. I will take care of everything myself, without troubling you and mother. Please, father. No means no. My father coldly brushed me off and left. I looked at my mother and could only cry. She helplessly hugged me and cried with me. A few days later, I was hired as a worker at a factory sorting and packing agricultural products. My job started at 7 a.m. with overtime until late at night. The money I earned was used to pay off the large debt my father had incurred. Those days were truly exhausting for me, with the pressure from family and work making me feel like I was about to explode. About a year later, to have more personal space, I decided to live alone. Besides working at the company, I kept to myself in my rented room. I didn't dare spend money on food or luxuries to save money for my family's debt. There were times when my pockets were completely empty. How about it, girl? Got any money today? We've been waiting a long time. Should we just throw your father in jail? The debt collector my father owed money to threatened, his tone menacing. I just gave you money last week, didn't I? I replied, my voice shaking. That little amount, do you know how much your father owes? Do you want to die? He snarled. But now, I really have no money. Please give me a few more days. A few more days, huh? Let me warn you, in a week, if there's no money, I'll kill your whole family. Better find a way to get the money soon, the debt collector threatened harshly. He and my father often came to my rented room to demand money. When I said I didn't have any, they trashed my belongings and threatened me in various ways. I lived in constant fear and anxiety, causing my friends to gradually distance themselves from me. I didn't dare get close to anyone, isolating myself and living in loneliness. It was a very difficult time. Even now, thinking back, I still feel a chill. Every day was a struggle, not just financially but emotionally as well. I often found myself overwhelmed by the sheer weight of my responsibilities. The loneliness was suffocating, and I missed the comfort of having someone to talk to, but I knew I had to endure. I had to keep going for the sake of my family. Each night, I lay awake, thoughts racing through my mind about how to find more money, how to escape the clutches of the debt collectors, and how to finally find peace. Even when I moved to my rented room, the fear followed me. 
The debt collector's threats echoed in my mind, and I couldn't escape the constant dread that hung over my life. I avoided making friends, afraid that any connection I formed would be tainted by the mess my life had become. My room became both a sanctuary and a prison. It was the only place where I felt even a shred of safety, yet it also isolated me from the world. One particularly terrifying evening, the debt collector came with two large men. They ransacked my room, breaking what little belongings I had, and made it clear that if I didn't come up with the money soon, they would make good on their threats. The fear and helplessness I felt in that moment were indescribable. It was as if my entire world was closing in on me, and there was no escape. Despite these horrors, I tried to find small moments of hope. I clung to memories of happier times, of dreams of a future where I could study and build a better life. These dreams kept me going, even when everything seemed hopeless. Looking back now, I realized that those dark times forged a strength in me I didn't know I had. At the time, all I could feel was fear and despair, and a desperate need to survive one more day. After about a year of living alone and working tirelessly, I met Jason. He was a bright spot in my otherwise bleak existence. We met at a local cafe where I often went to escape my grim reality, even if just for a few minutes. Jason was kind, attentive, and seemed genuinely interested in me. For the first time in a long while, I felt seen and valued. He had a way of making everything seem brighter, and for the first time in a long while, I felt genuinely happy. We started spending more time together, and gradually, he became my anchor. His presence in my life gave me a reason to smile, a reason to hope. We would spend hours talking about our dreams, our fears, and our future. He encouraged me, and for a while, it felt like everything might just be okay. We fell in love quickly, and he made me believe that better days were possible. However, just about a year later, another crisis hit. My company went bankrupt and I became unemployed. The news hit me like a ton of bricks. Without a steady income, the pressure from my father's debt collectors became unbearable. They continually came to demand payment, not just from me but also from my mother and sisters. The stress was overwhelming and I felt like I was drowning. At my lowest point, I discovered Jason with another girl. I couldn't believe my eyes. I stood outside the door, covering my mouth to stifle my sobs. The sight of them together shattered my heart into a million pieces. I wandered aimlessly through the night, with a heavy rain soaking me completely, as if the heavens were mocking me. Each raindrop felt like a reminder of my misery, my loneliness, and my despair. In the days that followed, in an attempt to hold on to my relationship, I pretended nothing had happened. I was desperate to keep the one person who had brought light into my life. However, Jason grew colder and continually avoided me. His warmth and kindness were replaced by indifference and distance. Let's break up. I don't have feelings for you anymore, Jason said one evening, his voice void of emotion. Jason, why are you saying that? I love you. I can't live without you. Please don't break up with me, I'll die. My voice cracked as I begged, tears streaming down my face. Despite my constant begging, Jason resolutely turned his back and left. I was devastated. The man who had once been my source of strength had abandoned me when I needed him the most. I locked myself in my room feeling despair take over my body and mind. My thoughts spiraled into a dark abyss, and I felt completely and utterly alone. I fell into a deep depression, seeking an escape from my suffering. I stopped eating, stopped talking to anyone, and spent most of my days in bed. The world outside seemed distant and uninviting. Sleep became my only refuge. Devastated, I locked myself in my room, consumed by hopelessness. I fell into a deep depression, wanting to escape the pain. I took a lot of pills, hoping for release, but instead I fell into a 50-hour coma. I drifted into sleep, feeling like I was flying, so light and free. In my dreams, I revisited my past. All my memories, both good and bad, came flooding back. I saw myself as a child, laughing and playing without a care in the world. I relived the moments of joy and the moments of pain. Then everything lit up. During that time, I was transported back to various moments of my life, both joyous and sorrowful. I saw my younger self, full of dreams and aspirations, and I relived the heartbreak and struggles that had shaped me. Oh, my poor daughter, does it hurt a lot? Don't cry anymore. Let me apply some medicine for you, my mother said, her voice soft and soothing as she dabbed ointment on my bruises. Mom, why does dad always favor lying? I didn't do anything wrong. I saved up my own money to buy that watch, I cried, the injustice of it all burning inside me. I know, I'm sorry you had to endure so much, but I don't know how to make it up to you, she said, her eyes filled with sadness and helplessness. My mother was a very pitiable woman, bearing the burden of our family on her shoulders, working tirelessly from morning till night to take care of us. She loved me very much, but often she could only hug me and cry. Her own strength was waning, yet she always tried to be there for us, even when the weight of our family's problems seemed too much to bear. Sister Lisa, are you hurt? Let me blow on it for you. Don't cry. If dad doesn't love us, we'll love each other, my youngest sister Lily, said with a child's innocent wisdom. The three of us hugged each other tightly, and my mother stroked our heads, unable to hold back her tears. Everything before my eyes blurred, replaced by the image of Jason lovingly looking at me. Moreover, Jason and I met one fateful rainy afternoon. I was walking home when it started to pour, 
and I was frantically looking for shelter when Jason came up behind me and covered me with his umbrella. The moment our eyes met, my heart skipped a beat. Jason had a handsome face with beautiful brown eyes that seemed to see right through me. It turned out Jason worked at a factory next to my company, and from then on, we became close. Our relationship quickly turned from friends to lovers. Despite being busy with his own work, Jason always made time for me. He cared for me deeply, supporting me through all my difficulties. He was there during the tough times, offering a listening ear and a comforting presence. Jason shared my dreams and encouraged me to keep going, no matter how hard things got. He became my strongest emotional support, the person I could rely on when everything else seemed to be falling apart. It was a time when I truly felt happy and hopeful about the future. I saw Jason as my whole world, the one person who made all my struggles worthwhile. But in the end, he betrayed me, and my mind was shrouded in darkness, as black as ink. Discovering him with another girl was like a knife to my heart. I felt utterly lost and abandoned. The one person I thought I could count on had turned his back on me, leaving me to face my demons alone. In my moment of not finding any reason to live, my mother's image once again appeared clearly before my eyes. When I was 20, I fainted at the company and was taken to the hospital by my colleagues. My mother stayed by my side, taking care of me with a dedication that only a mother could show. Lisa, you look so pale lately. Have some porridge to regain your strength. The doctor said you were severely malnourished. You've been sleeping for over a day and a night. My poor daughter has endured so much hardship. Recently, I took on more products to work on at home. Just rest. Don't worry too much about money. I'll manage. My mother gently said, feeding me a spoonful of porridge. After a while, she helped me up and used a warm towel to wipe me down. Her hands were rough from years of hard work, but her touch was tender and full of love. You've been sick so often, Lisa. I'm sorry. Tears rolled down her cheeks, and I felt a sting in my nose, quickly wiping away the tears welling up in my eyes. I had grown up and gradually understood my mother's suffering. I loved her very much. In front of her, I always tried to be strong so she wouldn't worry. Seeing her frail back, her tender care for me, and her graying hair, I couldn't hold back any longer. I burst into tears like a child. I hugged my mother tightly, and she cried too, continuously stroking my back. Lisa, my dear, don't cry. You've been through so much, haven't you? I love you so much, and I'm so sorry. You have nothing to apologize for, Mom. I love you so much, too. I managed to say through my sobs. We hugged each other, crying uncontrollably. I heard my mother's sobs echoing in my ears, and slowly I regained consciousness and woke up. The light was blinding. But the warmth of my mother's presence made me feel safe and loved. Oh, my beloved daughter, you're awake. My daughter is awake. Lily, go call the doctor. My mother held my hand, looking at me lovingly with tearful eyes. I felt the warmth, the love of my mother, a sacred affection that comforted my soul. Her presence was like a beacon of hope, pulling me out of the darkness I had been engulfed in. The doctor came, checked my pupils, blood pressure, and pulse. He said I was fine. Thanks to my mother's timely discovery and bringing me to the hospital, my life was saved. I had been in the emergency room for about four hours and then remained in a coma for 50 hours. During that time facing death, I had dreams about the things I had experienced and I realized I wanted to live. I no longer wanted to die. I wanted to live for myself, for my mother, and for those who loved me. The painful experiences that happened to me were not something anyone wished for. It wasn't my fault, but I had to accept and overcome my destiny. Through the window of the hospital room, I watched the sky outside and took a deep breath. Around me were patients fighting illness day and night to cling to life. I felt truly regretful. Seeing their struggle, I realized how precious life is and how much I had taken it for granted. How are you feeling? My mother asked, her voice filled with concern and relief. I'm fine now. I'm sorry. I'll never worry you like this again. I responded, my voice weak but sincere. I'm sorry too, Lisa. Oh, your father came to visit you. He also regrets everything that happened, she said, her eyes filled with a mix of sorrow and hope. I accidentally looked out of the hospital room and saw my father standing outside watching me. Seeing me, he turned and walked away. I ran after him, my body still weak but driven by a need to confront and understand. Seeing his wrinkled, teary eyes, I felt a pang in my heart. All the negative thoughts I had about my father suddenly disappeared. I realized he had been suffering too, in his own way. Dad, I called out, my voice trembling. He stopped and turned to face me. Lisa, I'm sorry, he said, his voice cracking. I've made so many mistakes. I know, Dad, we all have, but we can't change the past. We can only move forward, I replied, tears streaming down my face. I was discharged from the hospital and quickly returned to my daily life. I felt a surge of positive energy flowing through my body, with beautiful things waiting for me ahead. However, life wasn't as easy as I thought. Difficulties still came and overwhelmed me. The cycle of work and money continued to consume much of my time and energy. Walking through familiar streets, memories and pain about Jason flooded back, making my heart ache. I passed the cafe where we used to meet, the park where we'd spend lazy afternoons, 
and the little bookshop where he'd buy me my favorite novels. Each place was a reminder of what I had lost, and yet they also reminded me of the strength I had found within myself. Despite the recurring pain, I always tried to overcome every hardship and live better each day. The amazing experiences I had during the 50 hours of deep coma helped me awaken and believe more in life. They taught me that life is unpredictable and often harsh, but also incredibly valuable. When I woke up, everything felt different. The world seemed brighter, and I had a newfound appreciation for life. I realized that despite all the suffering, I wanted to live. I wanted to fight for a better future, not just for myself but for my mother and siblings who depended on me. After my recovery, I returned to work, this time with renewed determination. I took on multiple jobs, saving every penny, and slowly started to pay off the debt. I also began to reconnect with old friends and make new ones, allowing myself to trust and be open again. I threw myself into my work, not just to earn money but to find a sense of purpose. I reconnected with old friends and made new ones, slowly rebuilding a support network. I volunteered at local shelters and community centers, finding solace and helping others. Each act of kindness, each connection, reinforced my resolve to live a meaningful life. At home, things began to improve as well. My siblings were growing up, and we all pitched in to help our mother. The debt, though still a heavy burden, seemed more manageable with each passing day. My father, too, changed. He started attending counseling and made genuine efforts to mend his ways. Our relationship, once strained and distant, began to heal. Through this journey, I learned that life is filled with ups and downs, but it is also full of unexpected beauty and strength. I discovered a resilience within myself that I never knew existed. Each day was a new opportunity to grow, to heal, and to build a future I could be proud of. The experience of being in a coma had shown me the value of life and the importance of resilience. It taught me that no matter how dire the circumstances, there is always a reason to keep going. As I share my story now, I hope it serves as a reminder that no matter how dark and difficult life may seem, there is always a reason to keep going. Life is precious, and every challenge we overcome makes us stronger. The darkest moments can lead to the brightest realizations, and it is in our most vulnerable times that we find our true strength. Never have the same thoughts as I did. Life is priceless, and after the rain, there will be a rainbow. I believe that with all my heart. What do you think about this story? Please share your comments down below. Thank you for listening to Vibe Tales. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you.